Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's June 29th, 2023. It's a Thursday. And just a couple of days away from wrapping up the first half of the year. And a couple of days away from a big holiday, July 4th, coming up as well. On today's show, it's going to be a big show. We're going to wrap up those first six months. But more importantly, we're going to look ahead. As I always say, you can't drive a car looking in the rearview mirror. So we need to look ahead. What stocks, what trends, what factors, what catalysts, whatever you want to call them, are going to move the market in the next six months. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Over 1 million people around the world follow Wall Street veteran Mark Chaikin for his shockingly accurate stock market predictions. He just gave them a dire warning. Mark says, we're about to witness an historic stock market shakeup that can soon create devastating losses for investors who don't know what's coming. And as a result, you only have 90 days to move your money. You see, Mark spent 50 years on Wall Street at some of the most prestigious hedge funds in history. And he's been on Fox Business and CNBC countless times. But this is a financial story no one else is telling. And if you let this take you by surprise, you could be in for a world of pain. He explains everything in a brand new free report available at rollingcrash2023.com. He includes a name and ticker of a popular stock that could be directly impacted by what's happening as well. Mark warned of the beloved pet brand Chewy before it fell 45%. Tech company C Limited before it fell 66%. Furniture company Wayfair before it fell 76%. Social media favorite Snap before it fell 36%. And food delivery company DoorDash before it fell 65%. Mark even called the Amazon crash before the Fang stock fell 35%. So you'll want to avoid the stock in this new report immediately. Again, simply go to rollingcrash2023.com for your free copy of this new report. Again, thanks for joining me. This is Matt McCall. This will be the last show of the first half of 2023. And you know, they say, folks, uh, time flies when markets are moving higher. And I'll tell you, uh, they have been moving higher this year. It's been one hell of a first half of the year. Uh, S&P up nearly 15%. Uh, that will be the best first half of the year since 2019. And that's, of course, the year before covid uh, we have the NASDAQ um, up about 30%. That's a NASDAQ composite. That's a huge amount of stocks in there. And then we have the NASDAQ 100, which is the 100 largest stocks in NASDAQ composite, uh, X financials without financials, up about 37% uh, through the first half of the year. And that been led by what they've been calling the big seven. And those are the stocks you've all heard about, the AI stocks uh, led by N NVIDIA. Uh, then we have the Googles, the Apples, you know, you know. You know, the, the big seven out there. Uh, so the big seven have been moving the markets for the most part. Um, that being said, we're going to talk about the small cap stocks that, in my opinion, had a major breakout in the last couple of weeks and can be setting up for some outperformance here uh, in the next six months and beyond. And, you know, looking at the first half numbers, it's kind of amazing. Tesla, Meta, the old Facebook, and NVIDIA all doubled in the first six months of the year, doubled. And what's amazing about it is the size of these companies. NVIDIA is now worth over $1 trillion. Meta and Tesla, both between $750 and $850 billion. These are enormous companies to be doubling. Granted, they'd be half that you know, before they doubled, but still enormous companies to double. I remember when Apple... Uh, hit one trillion a few years ago. Everybody's saying, I can't believe this. How did it get there so fast? This is the end. Then it hit two trillion, not too long after. Now it's getting close to three trillion. And an analyst just this week put out a report saying Apple's going to be worth four trillion in a couple of years. And I've got to be honest with you folks. By the end of this decade, the roaring 2020s that we're three years into now, by the end of this decade, there will probably be a $5 trillion company. And you think that sounds outlandish, but just look at some of the moves we've had in some of these large cap stocks in the last few years. And the convergence of the innovations going on right now are going to lead to returns like you've never seen. Well, not never, that you've not seen since the 90s when we had major convergences come together there. We had PCs, uh, we had the internet coming all with that. Uh, then we had, obviously, uh, 
mobile phones, uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, we had uh, semiconductor speed uh, through what's called Moore's Law, getting faster and faster at rates that we've never seen before and cheaper and cheaper, allowing everything out there uh, to be uh, available to the masses day by day, it seems like. Uh, we're seeing something similar right now, and we're going to talk about a couple of those trends. So as I mentioned on the show, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some trends uh, that I like, mega trends, the second half of the year I think you need to keep an eye on. Uh, I got a bunch of charts I want to show you because I think it's really important to put a lot of stuff in the visuals. Uh, but real quick, you know, kind of what's going on right now. And uh, one thing that's going on right now is there's still that inflation Fed talk. We know the Fed paused, uh, but the Fed has a couple more meetings left this year. Powell came out this week, Jay Powell, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman. Uh, he came out and said that he uh, doesn't expect to see 2% inflation anytime soon, and that is the, the Federal Reserve's goal. So if they don't see it and he's truly going to stick by that goal, it means maybe he's going to be forced to continue to raise interest rates. There's about a 75% chance this week uh, that the next meeting uh, we will see a rate hike of 25 basis points after the pause we just saw. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a horrible idea if they do that. Uh, do I think they will? I'll let you know as it gets closer because a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, I, I do believe that the Fed should remain paused and not consider cutting anytime soon, but should really consider being paused for a few meetings, a few months out, uh, at least through the third quarter and give the market time. I mean, if you had, if you were going to raise it by 25 again, no matter what, why would you pause? Just keep going and get it over with. Pull the damn Band-Aid off. So this Fed to me is is honestly so freaking lost. It, it's it's pathetic. Um, and not going to get political in this show, but I got to tell you, the more and more I see and the more and more that I hear uh, from politicians uh, on both sides of the aisle, just so happens Democrats are in charge of the White House right now. So they, they get more finger pointing than anybody. Uh, some of the stuff I've heard just in the last week, uh, coming from this administration about the economy is not even laughable. It's embarrassing because either they are that freaking stupid and they believe what they say um, or they're lying to us and they think we're that stupid. So somebody here, you know, stupid is stupid does. Not quite sure what that even means, but I always like that saying. Uh, if we believe it, we are the dummies. We are the dummies. But that's a different tangent, and it's a show I'm going to get into because I think it has to be told a story, uh, but not today because we're going to keep it positive because we've had one hell of a first half of the year, as I just mentioned. Um, inflation fed is a big trend. We need to keep an eye on it. was a big trend in the first half of the year. Recession talks were a big trend in the first half of the year. Still big talks in the second half of the year. Uh, and, of course, bubble talk goes along with that. We've heard a bubble talk here recently, especially for tech companies, AI companies. I talked all about that in my recent AI show. Check that out. We're not in a bubble in terms of tech stocks. And you cannot compare this uh, to 2000, late 90s with the bubble. You just can't. You can't compare it to 08, 09, great financial crisis. It's not even close to being similar, folks. It's not. So get the bubble out of your head. Uh, it's just not there. Uh, so let's take a look here. Let's take a look at our, uh, our first chart I want to jump into. This, is, this says, uh, you know, does a strong first half mean a strong second half? Uh, and uh, the information came from Carson Group and um, Ryan Dietrich over there, who's a, who's a friend of mine. So it shows uh, first halves of the year going back to 1950 on the S&P 500, uh, where the S&P 500 was up at least 10% in the first half of the year. And then it shows return for the month after that, three months after that, six months would take us to the end of this year, and 12 months to the middle of 2024. And of course, long-term investing. I don't care about one month, but let's look at 12 months. Well, of the times this happened in the past, 77% of the time, it was higher 12 months later, uh, with a median gain of 13.5. So it's a little bit higher than you would have at any rolling 12-month period uh, over the last 70 years or so. So it's going to be a little bit better. What I like, though, is they got about a three and four chance of the market being higher. Now, here's another one. And this is, it again, if the S&P uh, had 10% year-to-date at the end of June, so 10% return uh, by the end of the uh, first half of the year. However, you throw one other layer into this, and that is the S&P had negative returns the year before, which, of course, it had a negative return last year. Uh, so here's 2023. You can see it there. The return last year was a negative 19.4. And um, uh, these returns is 12, showing 12.7, but it's actually closer to 14. It's about a week old. So it's going to meet the threshold. There's no doubt of that. And then we look ahead again. 12 months, folks. Let's look ahead 12 months. 
the average gain 14.4, the median gain 10%, and higher 89% of the time. Even six months out, 11, between 11.8 and 12.4%, the median and the average, up 89% of the time as well. So what I like here is that you have uh, that, that percentage, basically nine out of 10 times is going to happen, which is exactly what happened. Nine out of 10 times as well as up. Um, in 75, it wasn't up after six months. And in uh, 61, it wasn't up after 12 months. So you need to go back decades, way before I was even born, uh, to see times that didn't work in the past. And, and what this typically means is you have a rough year. And the market, don't forget, the market goes up majority of the time, about seven out of 10 times. So after a down year, there's a good chance the next year is going to be up. And then you throw in the fact that the six months after a down year, you're up, it shows a momentum has swung. We're talking talk, talk about that momentum right now. This chart shows uh, good things happen when you're 20% off the lows. And when you're 20% off the low, technically, uh, you're in a new bull market. This looks back now, uh, at, at going back again to 1950. And it shows when that happens. And that just happened uh, uh, about within the last month. And it shows the 12 month and the median return after that both happened to be 17.7% and higher 92% of the time. So again, these numbers keep getting bigger and better uh, in these types of situations. And this is, again, we're going back 70 plus years, folks. Um, before I get into the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit here about the market. And, and you know, people will always say, Matt, well, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen this time. And even the last one you showed us, one out of those 10 times, it didn't happen. No, nothing certain, folks. However, you got to put the odds in your favor. Many of you know I like to play cards. Uh, I like to legally gamble on sports. I like to go to Las Vegas once every two years or once every year for the Stansbury Conference and play a little blackjack. I think it's fun. I don't go in trying to think I'm going to make money, uh, but I think it's fun. But I always know that I choose to sit down at a table or sit down to play with others or sit down to watch a game and bet on it when I feel the odds are in my favor. Does it always work out? No. And sometimes I'm delusional and the odds are not in my favor, but I think they are. When it comes to the stock market, we are consistently looking for situations where the odds are in your favor. Those numbers I just showed you that the situation we're in right now, with a very strong first six months of the year for the last 70 plus years, and you throw in the negative year prior, the odds are very, very good between 70 and 92% that the market's going to be up. I'll play those odds all day. You know, I had a discussion with my therapist on Tuesday, and we were kind of laughing about a few things. And she said to me, she goes, you know, I, I've known you for several years now. She's like, you're very calculated. Every decision you make, even little things in life. If I'm going to get a chai latte, sometimes it gives me a stomach ache. I'm taking the risk. What's the reward? I really want to taste a chai latte today. And I did that this morning. And it didn't work out well. My risk, was, didn't, my, didn't come, my risk came through. My reward didn't come through. And same thing in the stock market, folks. You have to know what your risk is and what your reward potential is at all times. And right now, to me, it's being in the U.S. stock market. So speaking of that, uh, let's go over here to the uh, Russell 2000. These are the small mid-cap stocks. It's a group of 2,000 stocks. This is the IWM. It's the um, ETF that tracks that index. I've talked about this a lot in the past. There's a lot of stuff going on here. It's confusing, and it's okay. What I'm trying to show you here on the right-hand side is that it broke to a multi-month high, uh, which is a very good sign. It's since come back, pulled down, uh, and sitting on that support level. Uh, also, there's a yellow line and blue line. That's a 50-day and 200-day uh, simple moving averages, both long-term trend uh, uh, trend lines, and it's above both. And, and to me, that is a start of what I believe can be a very, very strong next six to 18 months in small cap stocks. So we'll talk about more about small caps in a moment, but I, I thought that was very important uh, to discuss that. Now here is um, um, a chart that I got from Ned Davis Research. And uh, this is a pretty interesting um, chart. It shows a U.S. recession probability. And it, it, what it does, it takes a bunch of different conditions uh, from the states. Uh, obviously, we have 50 states here, based on the states. And it gives you the likelihood above 50s, recession is likely, below 50, unlikely. And you can see that shaded areas are recessions. So most times it spikes up like that. You get a recession. And you see there's a little shaded part in the most recent spike because that was during, um, obviously, uh, the pandemic. 
we did have a spike back in 03, kind of a second spike um, after the uh, uh, tech bubble. Uh, but other than that, any other time that it's significantly been above 50, there's been a recession. Uh, there has not been a recession any other time where it hasn't gone above 50. And right now, we are down in the single digits. The highest we got, we're, we're, low, we're low 20s in the last year. We're in single digits. This is an indicator that goes back to the late 70s. So again, uh, you know, you could talk about recession all you want and, and talk about why and why not. It's just, it, it doesn't, I'm, I'm telling you, that, that I, I'm going to bring in another thing, you know, and it's called gut feeling. And when you've been looking at charts uh, like me for 25 years, you start to get just a feeling. Sometimes that feeling make, makes you have a bias decision, don't get me wrong, and it completely screws you up. I've, I've been there. I still go there. But for the recession, I really don't care because it's not going to affect my investing. Because by the time they tell you it's a recession, it's too freaking late. The market's already made its move. So for me, I don't, I don't care about the recession. So I, I, I'm, I'm indifferent. You can tell me a recession right now. And sure, I don't care. I'm still doing what I'm doing with my stocks. So I don't care, but I will tell you this. My gut tells me we're not going to go into one. It really does. Unless the Fed gets even more ridiculously um, out of line, which it could happen. I know, Maybe I'm being optimistic. I just don't see the recession happening at, at this point. And this is just one of many, many uh, indicators as to what. Let's talk about housing. I think this is important because I get questions on housing all the time, and I'm far from a housing expert. But here are two charts. Uh, one shows the U.S. existing home sales. This goes back uh, to uh, January of 99, both these charts, left and right. Uh, and this is year over year, cha year over year change of U.S. existing home sales. See, it spiked at 48 uh, back in uh, late 2020. And uh, we know that's why. Remember, houses were going bananas after the uh, uh, um, COVID thing. And it's since dropped down. We're now at a level uh, that we have not seen since uh, 08. And that's when, of course, uh, we had the bottom of the housing bubble, 07, 08, and the great financial crisis. And we saw what happened after that, it spiked back up. Uh, so maybe we're setting up for a, another spike here in home sales. I think we could. However, I'll talk about that in a second, why the wild card is. Right-hand side shows U.S. existing home um, median sales price. Again, falling uh, precipitously uh, on, the, on, the, on the sales price. We're actually down to cut off the right side of my uh, chart there, but we're down about break even right now. So we're actually getting close to being negative uh, sales price year over year change. I think that can continue to drop a little bit more. And I think that could be a bit of a catalyst. Uh, especially if interest rates come down at the same point. The one thing I, I will tell you about, about housing, and, and people are starting to talk about it a little bit more, you don't hear as much. The reason home prices, in my mind, still haven't really come down to negative yet, even though the home sales have dropped so much, uh, typically they go a little bit more hand in hand, uh, is because of inventory. And um, there was an inventory issue to, to, before all this stuff happened recently, the COVID thing. We've had an inventory issue for a while. But now we have an inventory issue because the percentage of people locked in to interest rates or mortgage rates, 4% below is so high that if they went now to buy a new home, even if they made some money, so to buy another home uh, or rent, but most likely buy another home, you're getting now a mortgage at 7%, so you're going to afford less home. So people are staying put, which makes complete sense. So I think that's going to lean on it until we see inventory start picking up, which means home builders need to build more homes, which means there's more demand for um, a lot of services and goods that go into homes. So think about that. Uh, you know, think you think all the copper that goes into it, all the electricians, all the HVAC systems, um, all the drywall. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, cement. So there's going to be a big demand for a lot of that stuff in the second half of the year, in my opinion. Uh, sticking with housing, this is a number of homes for sale. And this kind of backs up what I just said. It dropped to the lowest level on record in May. And this record only goes back to 2012. This is from Redfin. Uh, but it shows the active listings of U.S. homes for sale uh, back in January of uh, 2012. So about 11 and a half years ago, it was about, what, 2.75 million. Uh, we're now down to about 1.4. That's a huge drop. That's almost cut in half. Um, little, yeah, literally about in half, 1.37 million. Uh, so this is, a, this is an issue, as I mentioned. The inventory is a true issue. But again, I think this really helps a lot of home builders and home um, construction stocks, related stocks. Now let's talk inflation. Uh, this is a global supply chain uh, pressure index. And again, inflation is something that's a, a big deal. So look at this. Uh, this comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Look how it's come down now to the lowest level we've seen uh, in 25 years. 
So this, what this means, lower means that there's the supply chain's in better shape. You can see how it spiked, obviously, during, again, COVID going on, supply chains were shut down. It was a mess. Look where we've come down to. That really uh, could be a bit of a lagging indicator, but that really should take a ton of pressure off inflation. Now, what I want to show you here, this is, uh, uh, you can go to this website, just Google Trueflation. Uh, this takes into consideration many, many, many data points. Uh, and this uh, shows uh, trueflation over the last year. And right now it's down to 2.46%. And of course, as you can see below there, it says uh, the U.S. government reported 4%. So much lower than, than, than what the government says, because what they say and what I believe and I've been saying for many, many years is uh, the inflation data from the government is an extreme lagging indicator. And it is. And this, this is supposedly based on real-time data. Here, I'll show you a quick breakdown of this. Uh, this is how they did it in 2022. I assume it's the same. Uh, but you show housing. You know, housing is about one third of the CPI. Here, it's about uh, just under a quarter. Transportation, food and alcoholic beverages. Obviously, it's important. Healthcare, durables, household goods, et cetera. But you can see the breakdown. But if you want more information, just go to Trueflation. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, the point I want to show here is that I think inflation does continue to come down, which if the Fed gets their head of the sand, they actually realize that that it's a lagging indicator. It takes time. And then eventually uh, we'll see the house or the um, uh, jobs market. And uh, it's still great, but slow down from where it was, not as hot. That will also uh, help force the Fed to stay on the sidelines. Another chart here I want to show you. I just found this interesting. This has nothing to do with really kind of anything I've been talking about. I guess it has to do with inflation a little bit. This goes back uh, to uh, the early 90s and uh, the last uh, 30 years. Uh, so it'd be uh, 93. It shows the inflation adjusted return of the S&P 500 at time frame being 681%. Inflation adjusted, not straight out, inflation adjusted. And it also shows the purchasing power of the U.S. consumer dollar down 52%. I got this from Charlie Biello. Uh, I've never seen his chart presented like this and I'm going to use it. And I'll give him credit every time I do because it's an amazing chart. Uh, it comes from Y charts, which we have, our team has anyway, but uh, I've never aligned it up like this. So I give him kudos for that. And what I'm going to tell you here, folks, is if, if there's one chart that you need to look at, if you're questioning investing in U.S. stock market or you have friends or family members that do, and it might be a little bit harder to understand this. Uh, and they may say, oh, it's 30 years. The gain's amazing. You're up almost 700%, which is almost 8x your money. But the bigger number you should be looking at is the purchasing power of the U.S. consumer dollar. It's down 52% in that time frame. So if you're sitting there and cash and being safe, being conservative, you're getting absolutely hammered. Hammered. Sorry for whispering like that. I felt like Biden there whispering. Um, but seriously, this is a chart that when you go to bed at night, look at it. When you wake up, look at it. And it gives you faith long-term in the U.S. stock market. And you can see that blue, that blue line doesn't go straight up. We had a sideways market there for a while. That's okay. Because your money be losing sitting in cash. Keep that in mind. And your money eventually went up. So that's the last little chart I got for you. But now, here are the mega trends I want you to keep an eye on uh, for the second half of the year. In no specific order. And there's more that I like, but I didn't have time to do everything. First one is infrastructure. Um, we had the IRA, which is the most ridiculous name for a bill, the Inflation Reduction Act, which in my mind is probably causing more inflation, but neither here nor there. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, spending tons of money on infrastructure. Um, two areas in there that I, that I really like. Uh, one is clean water. We have a water issue. Um, obviously, we've known the drought issues we've had throughout the country, uh, even throughout the world uh, for decades now, if not centuries. Um, California, if you ask some people, has been in a drought for centuries. I know it's gotten a lot of rain here in the last couple of months, but overall, it's been in a drought and um, obviously hurts crops. We need more crops, more mouths to feed, prices go up, inflation. So there's a big deal there. Uh, and it's clean water it is also something that's very important because if you take a look around any city, if any of you live in New York City like I used to, I used to live on 56th and 8th, and you walk outside and you could probably go maybe one block without running into a uh, road being uh, dug up right there. And majority of the time it was a water break or a water main break because what they did is they didn't want to spend money. And these pipes, some of them have been there nearly a century. 
and they weren't meant to be there that long. So they would burst and they would just go boop, 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 fix it when it had to. Not pretty proactive, but fixing it had to. So clean water to me, there's a lot of different angles. Um, and for my subscribers, just so you know, I'm doing a lot of research on this now. Um, heck, 15 years ago in my book called The Next Great Bull Market. Don't buy that now because that's 15 years old. Uh, but uh, in there, I had an entire chapter on water. And I still think it's a great investment. Some of the stocks I recommended in there are up hundreds and hundreds of percent in that time frame. Uh, as I mentioned, energy grid, our grid is an absolute disaster. Uh, along with that, batteries, we need more battery storage because you could build all the solar in the world you want, but we don't have a grid to handle it, number one. Number two, we don't have batteries to store that. You're just going to waste it. So that's very important. Uh, sticking along those lines, energy. Uh, I look at energy in a couple of different ways, but the main way is a barbell. One side's dirty energy, the other side's clean energy. The dirty energy side's going to be what, just got, exactly what you think. Uh, fossil fuels, oil and gas, uh, crude, LNG, whatever you want to call it. The left side, uh, the clean energy is renewable. Uh, solar, wind, hydrogen, hy uh, hydro, uh, nuclear is going to be over there because that is clean as well. Um, and that's going to be on that side. So I think you have to look at uh, two angles right here and right now. On the dirty side, uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas. I think Europe's still going to have a big need for some LNG, especially if the summer warms up over there. Uh, their, um, their supplies will not be where they want them going into winter. Uh, so I think we will see some demand for LNG, especially here from the United States. So there's a lot of different ways to play that. And on the clean side, nuclear. I think nuclear is uh, one of the great investments over the next 10 years. And there's a couple of ways to play that as well. Uh, I have a couple of those plays in our newsletter uh, right now for subscribers. Again, kind of transitioning in nicely. Uh, transportation. You know, just this week, Wood, uh, Wood McKenzie, which is a research firm, came out and said the EV charging stations in the U.S. Uh, will grow to 18 million by 2027. That's a 4X from today. So 4X in four years. Uh, so Obviously, there's a way to play that. You know, we've seen Tesla get all these deals with uh, these major um, U.S. Uh, car manufacturers, uh, GM and Ford, to allow them to use Tesla's EV charging stations. There's going to be other smaller players out there that win as well. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on uh, when it comes to transportation. Uh, reshoring, uh, nationalization, um, supply chain, securing the supply chain, onshoring, uh, all different ways to say it. And that uh, that that's the... The concept of bringing your manufacturing and bringing your supply chain back, not necessarily to the United States, but most likely North America, somewhere nearby, uh, or in a country that's a strong ally of whatever country you are, and say it's the United States, for example. Uh, I see a lot coming back to the U.S., but I also see a lot going to Mexico. And I think Mexico right now, if you're looking for uh, an emerging market to look at, uh, I think is probably one of the uh, great investments for the next five years uh, in Mexico. Uh, just this week, there's news that we are going to ban some of our chips potentially uh, within the first week of July. And the next week, um, some of our AI chips are real high, high performance chips. I'm sending them to China. And that's why we saw NVIDIA and AMD, some others come down this week, midweek because of that. Uh, so we need to keep an eye on that. And what's going to happen? China might do the same to us. So we need to onshore. And a lot of other countries are in a very similar situation, onshoring, reshoring, whatever you want to call it, supply chain. Uh, it's going to be big news the second half of the year. Speaking of emerging markets, uh, a couple of emerging markets I think you want to keep an eye on. Uh, obviously, Mexico, I just mentioned. India has been really, really firming up. And um, you look at urban uh, areas in, in India, out of uh, all of Southeast Asia, um, really any major country there, uh, India has the least amount of uh, their population living in urban areas, and that's going to change. There is a huge opportunity in India. Again, this is a five to 10 year play. It doesn't go straight up. but something you want to consider. Uh, Taiwan, uh, I know it's very risky because of everything that's going on over there with China, uh, but I think that's an area that you need to look at uh, just because of the amount of chips that are going to be needed uh, for AI and quantum computing and everything else coming out in the next 10 years. Uh, it's another area I think that you want to uh, keep an eye on. Um, a couple more here. Um, healthcare. Uh, I've talked about, I did an entire show on obesity and uh, uh, diabetes drugs. That's the second half of this year is going to be huge. Uh, I think you can really see uh, Lilly move in the second half of the year. Pfizer got hit recently on its news, uh, along with a couple of others, because Lilly's numbers were so good. Pfizer's weren't as good, and they got rid of one of the pills, and they're going with just one. They said they're going to do that. So keep an eye on all those stocks. You know, it's, it's Pfizer, it's Lilly, uh, Novo Nordisk. Um, so those are, those are ones you really keep on. Some of the smaller names I mentioned in the show that I did prior as well. Uh, and then it comes down to um, uh, artificial intelligence in healthcare. Uh, just this week, there's a biotech firm uh, called uh, Insilico uh, based over in Asia. 
they announced that they have a lung disease drug. Uh, and it's the first drug that was entirely discovered and developed by artificial intelligence to reach phase two clinical trials. It's amazing. First of many, folks. Uh, so AI and healthcare are going to converge and change the world. Five to 10 years, probably 10. Healthcare, we, what you see, you, you won't believe it. If I told you today, you wouldn't know. And I can't tell you today because I don't know. I'm not a medical expert, but I'm telling you this much. It's going to be so different. You're not going to recognize it if you just went to sleep and woke up in 10 years. Um, you know, speaking of AI, I think you know AI obviously was the big trend in the first six months. I'm not saying it's not going to be important in the next six months. I think an artificial intelligence uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years uh, will be bigger than the personal computer, will be bigger than the internet, uh, will be one of the biggest trends uh, of generations. And uh, I think you need to be invested in it. I think the next six months could be a little rocky because they had such big runs. Uh, but I love artificial intelligence. I summon a portfolio and any pullbacks I'll be looking to buy into artificial intelligence. And then last but not least, I mentioned this chart before, the IWM chart, the Russell 2000. I think small caps are really setting up right now for one hell of a run the second half of the year. And then once that starts, I think that continues into 2024 and even further. Uh, we'll analyze as we get into next year. So again, there's a lot going on. I just went through a lot of information, uh, but those are just some areas I think you want to gain exposure to. And just putting those together right there, uh, that gives you a really nice diversified portfolio. I wouldn't stop there. There's a lot of other things I love, obviously, but these are ones I think that you're going to hear a lot of headlines about in the second half of the year that I want you to say you've heard you've heard it here and you didn't, you know, not that you didn't know about it. You did hear it and you listened to it here. So it's a lot of information, folks. Uh, I hope you take it all in. If you have any questions, please let us know, comment, share, like this video, uh, tell your friends and family. Uh, more importantly, um, we are not going to have a show on the, on the 4th. We'll come back on July 6th, that Thursday, uh, with a show at that point. Uh, so I hope everybody has a wonderful, safe, happy July 4th. I'll tell you this, you know, nice thing for me is I'm down here in Nicaragua, but we have a big celebration. As my local bartender called, asked me the other day, are you going to the gringo celebration? I said, absolutely. Fireworks, the whole ordeal, bands, DJs. But take this time to take politics, throw it out the window and just be humans and be Americans and be friendly with your friends, your family who may not stand politically on the side of you stand because at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We all want to be happy. We all want to enjoy life. So let's just do that. Um, after July 4th, I don't give what the hell you do. I do, but go back, to, try to stay that way, but at least do it for a couple of days, please. So again, have a happy, healthy July 4th and, uh, be back on July 6th with a great interview from an author of a book uh, I read a couple years ago and I fell in love with. And we'll have we'll have him on Thursday show. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.